And this is different than anything, any clinic around. Workouts that are tailored for her, and that really makes a difference. It's really personal. I've gotten way more mobile, stronger, flexible. So everything just improves me to the next level. Welcome to the On Cue Performance Therapy Podcast, where we push sports performance and physical therapy to its apex. We change the game by bringing together the brightest minds in the field to offer best practices and question how things are done today. I'm your host, Mike Quintins, physical therapist and expert in sports orthopedics. I'm living my dream and opened a clinic that unites all elements of sports medicine under one roof to drive recovery and performance outcomes. So I'm joined today with Rob Rubina, the Director of Sports Performance at MSI or Maple Sports Institute in Boothwin, PA, which is about 20 minutes outside Philly. Rob is an adjunct professor at the Widener University uh, where I attended, so go Pride. He has an extensive history of working with baseball players from youth ages to professional athletes. Rob specializes in shoulder assessments, coaching, fitness training, athletics, and program design. Prior to being the director of sports performance at MSI, he's the head strength conditioning coach at Cabrini University in Radnor, PA. Rob works with, with a number of MLB players that he trains during the off season and has created quite the reputation for himself in not only this region, but across the country. So w- welcome to the welcome to the podcast, Rob. How you doing, man? All right. Mike, thanks for having me. Really excited to be on. Um, pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's a big time pleasure. It's funny. Uh, I've known Rob. Since we, we played Little League Baseball together, uh, eight, nine years old, we were, we were kicking back it on all star teams. <laughs> yep. Way back in the day. Uh, and great family, great, you know, your brother Phil, my brother were the yep. same age. So it, it's, um, it's been cool from my perspective going the PT route, uh, kind of seeing what you do and, you know, kind of wish I'm like, man, I did that. That's awesome. He's working with athletes. Uh, and, and now kind of like that, you know, world's crossing paths a little bit. So welcome to the podcast, man. This is cool. No, thank you. Yeah, so uh, let, let's get into it. So tell me about your background. Uh, what led you to baseball, baseball um, and strength conditioning? Yeah, so my background is pretty interesting. I um, you know, went to Cabrini as an undergrad student, did exercise science, um, you know, had knew I kind of wanted to do strength and conditioning, but like wanted to try different things and see if I like personal training, corporate fitness, um, you know, college setting. So I did some internships as an undergrad student there. Um, you know, I did one at a commercial gym, did one at a, at a, at a Villanova. Um, so, you know, try different things, see what I liked. I really fell in love with strength and conditioning at the college setting. Um, so then I went to grad school at East Stroudsburg. And, uh, when I, when I, when I got there, um, one thing that we decided on was like, we had to be like, I had to be good at something. And, you know, we decided that my, my something was going to be, it was going to be baseball training. So we set up my, my master's research, which was just published, uh, not that long ago, um, we, I trained the baseball team, I trained the softball team, and then my, my grad school internship was at Cresty Sports Performance, which is all baseball. So, you know, I was kind of, it's kind of set up nicely to, to uh, dive into the baseball um, athlete and the demands of baseball and what it takes to, to throw hard and hit home runs at a high level. Um, so it was, it was a lot of, you know, my, after grad school and then entering at Cresty is really when I like really learned a lot and had really good mentors um, there when it comes to like being a strength coach. So that was, that was a, a great experience for me, you know, just observing, learning, coaching and trying a lot of different things, you know, learning from one of the best strength coaches in the country is like a, you know, can't ask for more than that. So, um, you know, finished there, came back to the Philly area and started on the side about a year after that. And I've uh, been here about seven years and, you know, at MSI right now, I'm in charge of running the performance center. Um, you know, I have a staff of strength coaches and, you know, we see all levels of athletes, obviously a lot of baseball players. It's, it's a large baseball academy with a field, hitting tunnels, you know. So we, uh, we do a lot of baseball training and the strength conditioning and then a lot of skill development that I'm involved in as well. And uh, just coming up with plans to help players, you know, reach their goals. And it's a it's a it's a great job, and I love where I'm at, and 
you know, now I'm getting into a little bit of teaching, which is something I always wanted to do. That was one reason why I got, got a master's degree was like, you know, you always come up you're like, Oh, like my plan is to work at a college and teach at that college. And now I'm in the private setting doing adjunct work on the side. So it's like, you know, it ends up working out and um, you know, I'm very passionate about strength, conditioning, fitness, exercise and baseball. That's awesome. I think it's pretty cool that, uh, you know, that you just kept fueling your passion. You kept learning. Uh, to me, I think that's what, that's what the, the great ones do is they put themselves in positions to learn uh, and you didn't go to the, to the Cressy uh, Sports Performance Center and, and try and flex and show how much you know. You said observation like twice, two or three times. So uh, that's pretty neat that, that, you, that you learned a lot there. And for those who don't know, uh, Cressy is a big time, like strength conditioning, baseball, like number one. I listen to this podcast all the time and uh, baseball and athlete development. Uh, you know, I think he talks about a bunch of different things that – uh, frankly, I think a lot of different athletes need to hear, not only baseball players. So um, tell me about that experience. What, what was that like for you in, in terms of like what kind of – you know that like this is where I belong. I, I can fit in here. Yeah, I mean, you know, going in as a grad student, there, there was all their interns that I was that I was there with. And, you know, I was the only grad student. Everyone else was an undergrad student. So I was – I had like a couple of years older than everyone else. And, um, you know, I went in like – obviously this is this is back in 2011 um so like back then like there wasn't a lot of social media it was like blog you like read blogs and like that's how and like youtube was like just getting started so um you know i was reading a lot of eric's blogs and you know it's a lot different like learning and like reading from someone afar and then like actually being there in person on a day-to-day basis you get to see the the uh, nuances about what makes a facility and someone very successful so that was some of my big you know, besides obviously like assessments, program design, you know, how to, how to coach and, and uh, what to look for, you know, that's the sexy stuff that like every strength coach wants to learn. But it, it, what I, what one of the other big, bigger takeaways was like, you know, uh, culture development, um, how to, how to develop a brand, um, you know, all those like other things that, that go into the working in the private setting that I didn't know about that I really took away from there, which was, which was great. And, you know, one other thing that I think really stood out for me and still, sticks with me to this day is um, athletes don't don't care how much you know until they know how much you care so that saying is really huge because you know what that pretty much means is just like doesn't they, like they don't care that i had a grad degree or that i research published or that i interned with this person or that my my knowledge doesn't matter to them what matters is that i i care for them and i'm here for them and i want to help them succeed so you know i mean it was a great experience can't say anything you know can't say enough good things about it it's cool. Uh, it comes out of caring, you know, and, and relationships. So well said on your end. And, um, and that's neat that you took that away. And, uh, you know, that'll be something that's not talked about enough uh, at, at that location in particular, that facility. So that's, that's cool. Um, all right. So tell me about assessments. Uh, I'm personally, and I've talked about it in my previous podcast, if there's a way we can use and prevention is not appropriate to use, but reduce risk of injury or identify deficits or impairments, uh, whether it's for an athlete going into playing the actual sport or an athlete that is uh, about to start training. So now you can design a training program accordingly. Uh, I, I'm curious as to how uh, you like to use, what is your view of assessments? Where do they come from? Um, are they research driven? Is it stuff that you've seen or heard? And, uh, and like, what, what are your go-tos? Are you doing lower body, upper body? What's it encompass? Yeah. So, I, I'm very, I, I think my assessment is pretty unique, um, especially in the, you know, if you talk to a lot of trainers or strength coaches, like most of them, if they do some sort of testing, it's just like a workout and it's like, you know, beat someone up. That's probably what like half trainers do for, for assessment. So my approach is, is, is a lot different. It's very data driven. Um, so what I mean by that is like, we'll first sit down with someone, you know, get to know them um establish some goals you know like why are you walking in the building to talk to me to exercise like literally why are you here like let's peel back the onion and try to identify you know why are you really here not just like oh i want to throw harder but like no like why do you want to throw harder oh i, I want to like play at a high level like oh okay so you want you want to make varsity yeah yeah i want to make yeah yeah that's what i want to do okay great like, so we identify some goals, 
both short term and long term, right? Um, go over injury history, medical history, all the basic stuff. Like, and, and and another big one for me is like, like, have you exercised before? Yes or no? I was like, yeah, okay, great. Tell me about that. Oh, I just like you know go to the basement and do some push ups. Okay, you you haven't done a strength conditioning program before. That's not that's not training. That's just like, you know, doing stuff in your basement. Um, so like getting a good training history to me is important. Like, have you worked with XX and X trainer before? Like, oh, I know that person. He's really good. I know you can probably start at X progression. Um, so getting a good training history is important to me. Uh, and then like, what sports you play? Like, you know, hey, do you play on? You know, especially in baseball, like do you play on two travel teams? Like, you know, what are you doing for baseball? What other sports do you play? What positions do you play? So we get that like athlete profile, like all laid out in front of us. And, you know, that way I have a good understanding about how I can go about helping this person. Um, and then once we get onto the training floor, I like to look at my assessment as three different areas. So the first area is just like a motor control, flexibility, range of motion, kind of area so i will do the functional movement screen uh as part of my assessment i look at that as just like what red flags are we going to have in doing basic exercise movements um or is there any limitations in active range of motion through a lot of different patterns that we'll do on the on in an exercise program okay um, after we'll do the fms i'll then put them on a treatment table and do passive range of motion tests so I will perform a hip internal external rotation. Um, we'll go and do some uh, pelvic positioning tests. So I've taken a lot of courses on Posture Restoration Institute or some PRI courses. For those who aren't familiar with that, um, just gives me a good picture of like where someone's hips are and how to go about best improving the ability of the hips to move. So we do some adduction drop tests or like, um, you know, um, what's the Ober's test, whatever it's traditionally called. Um, yeah. So we'll do some, do some pelvic positioning tests and then um, get, a, get a good look at the upper body. So like my upper body, obviously I see baseball players. So like we have to, we have to look at the shoulder and what encompasses the shoulder. Um, so that, that includes like shoulder flexion, uh, shoulder internal, external rotation, shoulder abduction. Uh, and then I'll look at the infrasternal angle as well. So look at the rib cage and get a gauge of like, Hey, like, where's this person's rib cage? Are they really wide? Are they narrow? And is it, is it dynamic? Are they able to actually move airflow, um, through that cage appropriately? Um, because the rib cage is really the foundation of which the scapula and arm sits on. So if you're just training or looking at shoulder internal rotation, um, that's literally like. Not the worst thing that like, there's not enough not that not i do well said amen uh it's not I, that, I mean it's important but it's not it's not where you, let me say this, it's not where you start <laughs> too sad <laughs> too sad right. and that's so, a lot man that's a, that's a lot i mean that is all, like you're doing like that's more of like than a, than a pt eval like i, I know pts that won't do a, a, a you know a tenth of that uh, yeah. and, and, and there's more so you're looking at I, I love the history too uh just to, like and, and i want to pick up right where you left off i don't stop mm -hmm. saying the thought, but a couple things. <laughs> oh i know i know you are and that's why I, like i'm like all right like quick intermission on that uh the history love it was you're, you're getting buyback from the athlete when you're asking them questions about what they care about because their that's whole true. lives i shouldn't say their whole lives i shouldn't assume that but more often than not they've walked into situations and they've been told, okay, you want to do this. You want to do that. And then I'm going to show you how I'm the guy that's going to help you. That's not, but that's not how they buy in. They've been told that no. before. Right. So, yeah. so they're walking into your building to get better. You're finding out why they want to get better, what drives them. You're building the foundation of that relationship. So kudos yes. on that. Um, I love that you're looking at range of motion. I love that you're doing essentially special tests uh, with uh, your, your Thomas test, your over test looking at hip flexibility you're looking at breathing patterns that's awesome uh i agree with you on the rib cage fms for those who don't know functional movement screening essentially is, uh the, like the basic of basic movement screening so identify red flags and and it, there it's objectively measured right so zero one or two uh depending on the specific test and there have been studies about if you score less than a 14 didn't participate in sports or your increased risk um it, essentially done by every um uh, most uh, disciplines when returning an athlete to a sport. 
So that's objective. Do you have objective measures that you utilize for your range of motion or for some of your other measures that you're that you're looking at for your assessment, or is it pass fail? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, no, I I use uh, you know numbers for range of motion: forty five degrees of internal rotation, one hundred and eighty degrees of shoulder flexion. Right. Um, you know, these are things that like I think most trainers can really learn very quickly. You know, I don't think it's that that challenging that just PTs can do this kind of stuff or just ATCs okay. can do this kind of stuff. Like, you know, I might not do it a hundred percent by the book, but I get, get the job done. No, you listen, know? I, um, I can't tell you how often I use a goniometer in the clinic. All right. So, so those, exactly. you know, but, exactly. but I think for some of these things, you're, you're identifying a deficit right? in, in asymmetry. Right. And so red uh, flags. it's looking for red flags. It's looking for like, okay, is your short, you come in and your soul flexion is 140 degrees and your internal rotation is 10. Like it's a major red flag. We're going to have compensations when we throw a baseball. Oh, your previous injuries of a uh, flexor strain in the elbow. Uh, probably not exactly. good. Probably. <laughs> so do you have normative data? Do you have cutoff values for some of these measures that are uh, like, or, like how does that work for you from that perspective? Yeah. I mean, I just go off the normative. You know, I want a hundred, I want 180 degrees of range of yeah. motion. You know, I want, I want, I want bilateral total range of motion in the shoulder. So I want my IR, ER, you know, to be equal on left and right. Um, okay. You know, there's some research on that. Um, you know, so I, you know, I, I want normal ranges of motion. Um, you know, I want, I want the joint to be able to move normally so that we don't have compensations when we need to move it. Touche, man. Touche. All right. Pick, pick up where you left off. So you were, you were talking about how, you, how you're looking at uh, different types of flexibility and mobility. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they, they look at, look at the, look at the body and see how it's moving. Um, do a little ankle dorsiflexion testing as well. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's my passive joint range of motion testing. Um, I will also, depending on the athlete, usually a college or a pro guy will do some like scap rhythm screening as well. So like shirt off, like let's look at the scapula and see if the scapula is upwardly rotating or if there's any winging or, you know, any, any again, any red flags that needs to be addressed in a strength and conditioning program. Um, you mentioned earlier, like, Hey, how do we help reduce injuries? Like, this is how I help reduce injuries by making sure that the joints are able to move in its normal range of motion under load. Um, so after all that, like passive, you know, motor control range of motion testing, I then do performance testing. So like, let's look at the engine, you know, uh, let's do a 10 yard sprint, a 20 yard sprint, which is looking at acceleration speed. We'll do an agility test. We'll do a broad jump. We'll do a vert. We'll do a repeated vert. Um, you know, lots of just like power based numbers. If I'm working with, um, you know, again, certain athletes will do some aerobic testing. For aerobic testing, we'll just get a resting heart rate, which, again, just gives me a basic idea of, like, how hard their heart's working at rest, um, you know, which is, which, is, which, is, which is great because if you get an athlete, they're like, oh, like, I just got to get tired at the end of the game. They're like, okay, well, just, you know, tomorrow morning, let me get your resting heart rate. Let's see where it's at. Okay, yeah, no problem. Come in. Oh, my resting heart rate's like 75. Well, guess what we're doing? We're doing aerobic training. So, you know, getting a resting heart rate is, the, is a good, good general ga uh, gauge of that. After the performance testing, we will go through a short workout. So I'll try some sort of push pattern, pull pattern, hinge, squat, and like a lunge. Different variations. Like I think this college athlete that I'm just did all this testing on can probably front squat. I think this 14-year-old needs to learn how to goblet squat. I think he can't do push-ups on the ground we're gonna do elevated hands elevated so i like test my theory see he can do it i want athletes to be and feel like they pass the test so i always go like oh i think this person might be able to do a trap bar deadlift at 135 but we're going to do a kettlebell elevated with like 70 pounds and gotcha. make them feel comfortable doing a hinge pattern so we try a couple exercises they get coached they they're working out with other athletes next to them. So they get, they see the atmosphere, they're in the atmosphere, they're in the culture. Um, you know, they go through a little workout, they sweat a little bit, they get coached. I see how they respond to the coaching. You know, I think they can kettlebell deadlift. I try to coach them to hinge. They still can't do it. They're going to have to regress that movement in their training program. So, you know, I, I it, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to, to get a gauge of if you know, hey, this kid's a beast. I can give him some hard exercises. 
you know, really gives me a gauge of their fitness level, essentially, you know, without doing traditional fitness testing. So that's probably the only, you know, I, I started this off with like my assessments, very data driven. This is the only time where I'm probably getting away from some traditional data tests because I don't feel comfortable in my setting doing some like traditional strength testing of like kids that I like don't think can move well. So, but even, but even then there's a philosophy to it. You know, you're, you're based on their performance uh, in your experience, you're recommending a movement uh, or an or resistance or a type of exercise, right. For a specific movement, like a, a hinge, for example. And if they're not able to perform it, you have a way of regressing that movement. Ooh, yep. it's, almost like, it's almost like an algorithm. So I think they can do this. Uh, all right, so let's back them off down to that. If, you know, and, and you already do that from go. So you pick an exercise that may be a step below uh, what you think that they could do regardless. So the concept of passing a test is, is, is in their head. They're not showing up and failing after being assessed Correct. all day. Actually. I think that, that's great from so many different Correct. levels, especially with Correct. baseball players. They're, you know, mentally, uh, that's, that's actually interesting because in PT, that, that's not, uh, it, I don't think it's encouraged enough. We want to find out what they're bad at and we want to offer exercises for it or do a manual technique to improve it. How often are they experiencing success on their on their on their first visit, especially? That's a lot right. to do. How, how did you do that on every that walks in the door? Or Everyone that walks in the door. Everyone that walks in the door goes through that assessment. Um, it's you know, and then we and then we sit down and talk about it. And to sit down and talk about it, you know, I I I used to make the mistake of like, oh well, hey man, your your shoulder flexion is really bad, your IR is bad, you have ones on your ASLR test. Um, you know, you only jump six, three, like I, I used to tell them like the thing that they sucked at, right, and that's right. when I realized, I'm like, wait, like, I got to stop doing that because like, that's not good from the mental side of like, they failed the test and, and, and you know, I, I want them to, to feel encouraged and feel positive. So now my, my recap is, Hey man, you did, you did a great job today. You know, here are some things I think we can improve upon. Um, but no worries. Here's my plan to help you with those areas. Has that, has that changed because of the psyche of the athlete in 2020 uh, versus 20, 2011 when you were at Crefty? Mm-hmm. Is this uh, your I, development? <laughs> my development. 100% All right. my development. Fair. I, you know, uh, at first I wanted, I, I, I think I did that because I wanted to show that I belonged. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I wanted to show that I wasn't an idiot and I thought that was the time to do it. But that's not, that's not the time to do it. Good for, good for you, man. I feel like it, at least you learned it, you know, and, and I, and I, that, yeah, I have, I've spoken to, and I'm sure you have too. When you have someone new that's on board, um, showing them that they can be vulnerable and ask questions and not always feel like they got something to prove. Uh, cause you teach, love to teach. I feel the same way. I, we have a, a wealth of knowledge that we're willing to share. And so, uh, so like, don't always try and prove to me how much I know, but I remember being in that position also feeling like, oh yeah, I could figure that out when I mm-hmm. probably should have just asked the question. So kudos to you on that. Um, no, for sure. All right. Sweet. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a lot of detail. So from there, how do you customize the program? I do have something that obviously you have, you have the functional patterns that you go through. Mm-hmm. Um, is it, is it all based on those initial exercises that you did and you have progressions to each how, the work and is it all movement based or is it baseball based? How, how do you do that? How do you handle that? Yeah. So, you know, uh, we, I take all of that data, you know, their goals, they want to throw harder. They range of motion is this, their performance is this, their fitness is this. I take all of that information. I say, okay, how many days a week do you want to come in? You know, let's design a strength training program for you to reach your goals. Um, you know, what's the best way I think I can help you reach your goals of throwing harder or whatever, you know, gain weight, whatever the goal is, right? Um, and then we do basic workouts. I think um, some sort of, you know, if they're doing, say they're working out four days a week, I might do like an upper, lower, upper, lower split, um, you know, some sort of like big multi-joint movement, like a deadlift. Um, and then I'll do like do a superset with that exercise. That superset could be a kettlebell bottoms up carry, which is just like a basic you know, arm care exercise, um, for the scapula and the muscles surrounding that it could be a dead bug variation. Um, and then my like next block is like some sort of single leg lunge. 
exercise paired with another exercise. And then my C block is another exercise paired with another exercise. And then my gotcha. D block so, is something so else. You're constantly else. supersetting so, exercises. Is that, is that yeah, accurate? So they're doing pretty much eight Love it. at minimum eight movements um, per day. Yeah. Uh, and I try to, to do a little bit of everything. So what I mean by that is like hinge, some sort of squat or lunge pattern, maybe another, you know, um, posterior chain movement. I love doing like a locomotion based movement. So what I mean by that is like, let's get athletes sprinting, jumping, throwing, changing direction type of movement, AKA be an athlete movement. Um, <laughs> you know, like I, like it, when you do strength conditioning, it, it's very easily to just like do a ton of strength stuff, you know, like, Hey, like, I'm a meathead, like let's lift weights and do heavy stuff. Like right. I love Amen, to do that. You know what I mean? But like athletes, they don't need that stuff. They need to be athletes, they need to be athletic, they need to run, they need to jump, they need to change direction. So like we need to program that stuff. Um, you know, and then mixing in some other things based on their assessment. So like if they came in with limited shoulder flexion, we'll do we'll do a maybe a, a exercise to to gain shoulder flexion back. If their rib cage is not moving dynamically when they breathe we'll do something to teach them to move their rib cage awesome. dynamically gotcha. um you know so like well, whatever their assessment tells me i'll program exercises to work on that um you know if they just want to throw harder and they don't have anything to work on then let's just kick butt i, I do I, I just there's so many positives here i don't know if we have enough time to dive into it uh <laughs> like it's well, our strength conditioning coach jordan does very similar in that like don't overthink the sport itself right like don't overthink the training to apply it to the sport so the point in doing all rotational stuff and all single arm like you know right right-handed exercises and so forth and stabilizing only the left glute because it's all baseball specific you're teaching athletes how to be athletes you know you're doing fun movements uh you're applying, you know, your hinge and your squat and your lunge and your pull and your push all in the same workout and a carry probably and other stuff. Yep. So, so yep. I, and, and then you're taking an opportunity to either make it maybe uh, unilateral, bilateral, posterior chain, anterior chain bias based on their deficits. And then you're adding in maybe a mobility or, or stability piece there to, to address their, their deficits. So you probably have that program as well. So I think that is aces, man. That's, that's cool because to be able to customize it but scale it at the same time is super tough because I'm sure you have a number of athletes and it's almost impossible with the way baseball is in this area as you've changed so much since we were kids playing together that it is uh, big time. I mean, it's massive. It is a, a beautiful, amazing facility with a great reputation. So uh, I know you're, you're busy in there and optimize everything and have the right coaches in place to, to be able to help you. It's not easy. So, so kudos on, on the whole programming. Um, okay. yeah, dude, that's, that's cool. Um, wow, man, I, I love it. And I'm happy yeah. you're changing direction and you're, and you're throwing and you're, you're jumping like baseball players think like, I, when do I ever jump? You know, you know, ask McCutcheon that and after coming off an ACL doing, and, you know, yep. in the middle of a run, something like that, you know? So, yep. yep. Um, no, it's, I think you said it well, I'm like, too, like, I'm not training baseball players. I'm training the individual, you know? And like, I'm fortunate enough at my setting where like I can allow my principles to, to really stick out and not be, and not be constrained via logistics. Example being like, if I worked for, you know, a pro team or a college team, like I see a team of people three times a week for an hour. I see 35 people three times a week for an hour. Like, yeah, like you're, you're probably not doing all these fancy tests. You know, you're probably to. not I mean, writing you're probably not writing customized programs, you know? Um, so it's, it, it, it depends on your setting. You know, my setting is, I'm very fortunate where like, you know, I can, I can do it the way I want to do it and it's better for the athlete. Well, yeah. And it's also driven. You're not just making stuff up. So, uh, that, that's, that's what's special because there's, there's evidence that supports it. And I'm sure you're changing it, right? You may come off screening test that assesses, uh, you know, like even like postural, you know, the whole pop, everything postural that you're doing with the breathing, probably within the last couple of years, you've been doing that. I don't know if you were doing that back in 2011 at Cressy. Uh, so, so you're constantly, um, you know, editing it and, and making it better. So, uh, well done. Yes. Um, yes. all right. Shoulder mechanics. 
What's your philosophy on shoulder mechanics? Uh, obviously, you've told, told us about the assessment. You're looking for bilateral range of motion. Um, that dynamically assessing uh, motor control, you do with uh, movement pattern with charts off. So you're looking at how the scapula, how, how scapula is moving relative to thoracic spine and posture. Um, so from a base perspective and biomechanics, I'm curious what your take is on on the shoulder. Yeah, I think um, my my shoulder again, like my shoulder assessment's pretty is pretty detailed. Um, so it, it lays a really good kind of picture for me. So if again for me the the assessments key. So like if someone comes in with limited shoulder internal rotation, you know, they're limited bilaterally, you know, that tells me a lot about what we have to do to improve this person's shoulder range of motion. Uh, I'm always going to try to improve range of motion first before trying to just like do a bunch of strength stuff in, on that shoulder. Um, we, we have to assume, and I think there's some research on this, Mike, that like most baseball players have labrum tears. They're just asymptomatic. So, you know, we, we have to assume that most baseball players' shoulders are pretty messed up. better and make it function better. And their ability to produce force better um, at the same time. So a lot of those things are always competing. I look at it as like, we need to drive fitness and we need to drive health at the and that sometimes is very hard to do um you know i think you just have to have a good balance in your training program for example like don't just do dumbbell bench press and then do a chest supported row and then do a dumbbell incline press and then cable flies like that's probably not a good day for a baseball player um you know for someone like myself it's a great day those are great exercises but the task at hand is throwing a baseball as hard as you can. So doing those exercises like that is probably not something that should be done. What instead that should be done is a half kneeling landmine press with a row and reach supersetted with a breathing exercise to drive air into the upper back to get the upper back to move and expand so that the rib cage, so that the scapula can sit more effectively on the rib cage so that when the scapula needs to glide, it's able to glide better. Okay, great. Next pairing half kneeling one arm cable row and reach paired with a push up with our feet into the wall. Great. Scapulars are moving. Rib cage is moving. Uh, we're gaining lots of rotation. You know, when we do a reach and row activity, you know, a lot of people ask me like, Oh Rob, what do you do for thoracic spine mobility? You know, I like to, to do trunk rotation drills that first understand how to get the trunk to control sagittal plane. So make sure the rib cage can drop down via really good exhale and not be an extension, right? And then be able to rotate the trunk. And the trunk rotates via reaching. You know, if you reach and row, the trunk's going to rotate and turn while it's in good position so that it's not extending. A lot of compensations and injuries happen when the athlete extends. You know, when you swing a bat and you don't have good hip internal rotation on the lead leg, your lower back's going to extend. If you try to throw and you can't rotate, guess what you're going to do? Extend. So you can't choose exercises that just drive extension all the time. Um, your C block is going to be, you know, back to all shoulder flexion and a step behind scoop toss. You know, those things are very task specific to the throwing athlete. Um, so again, like not saying that that first program was bad, but you see how that second program is a lot more detailed and focused on what has to happen on the field. You, know, you have to understand and respect what the baseball player goes through and what they need to be able to do something at a high level. And that's, and that's, that's how I think. And that's how I write programs. That's uh, amazing because none of them are isolated or uh, even sorted uh, posturally supported exercises. All of them are challenging uh, feet up against the wall, right? Like you're implementing like stability, right? Uh, and and if you're going to extend in that position, you're going to get you're going to get called out because it's going to be pretty easy for everyone in the gym to see extending with extending with your feet on the wall. Um, so so that that's pretty cool, man. Because so because you, you're implementing all the the foundation of course stability in conjunction to 
you know, scapular stability or uh, different types of mobility exercises. Um, so I, that's pretty neat. Are you at, what are you doing to limit extension on some of these movements? How, how are you, um, how are you positioning the, the lumbar spine in particular, right? Because that's what's going to compensate for a lack of thoracic mobility and for lack of hip internal rotation, especially on the lead leg, like you said. Um, so how are you limiting lumbar uh, extension in these movements? Yeah, I think the first thing that I'll do is teach someone how to fully exhale and then teach them how to pelvic tilt. Um, once you can do those two things at the same time, that lower back is not going to be extended anymore. And they're going to feel that lower back occasional tightness that they get go away. Um, so that's like first and foremost. And, you know, that's taught in a, in a basic warm up exercise through one exercise, you know, and then it's, it's, it's ingrained in your coaching throughout the rest of your movements. You know, I'm not coaching a deadlift to have chest up. I'm not using that cue. That's a poor cue. That cue drives extension, you know? Did um, you taught that cue back then? Did you ever get that cue? Um, yeah. No, the cue, that cue is, <laughs> in, it, that, everyone uses that cue. I don't right. use that cue. Ch squat, look, chest up. Make sure you can see chest the ceiling. Yeah, and now you're up, extending the spine, right? <laughs> just extension. It's lower back extension. So, right. like, you know, just like simple stuff like that, like doing away with that kind of stuff and, you know, teaching people how to, how, again, how to exhale pelvic tilt, feel hamstrings, feel glutes. You know, um, if you're in a, if you're doing a half kneeling kettlebell bombs up hold, which is a tremendous scapular exercise, yeah. you know, you can't do that exercise with the lower back and just the person's like leaning back, you know, they're arching and leaning back. Like that's not a good, that's not good. Um, you know, again, that's, you're doing a, you're training a scat, you're training the scapular muscles while the rib cage is in extension. So you're reinforcing bad patterns. So that's why it's always important to know how to coach first before you go ahead and try to program these fancy exercises. I always tell all my interns that I'm like, look, like, you know, like, Hey, you might be smart and have a 4.0, but like, if you can't coach your way out of a paper bag, you're no use to me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so true. And, and I'll take, I'll take the 2.5 any day. And if, if they're, if they're passionate about it and want to learn, um, you know, you, you can teach them the rest. So, uh, yep. well said teacher way out of a paper bag. I like that. Um, and, and, and with that takes a ton of focus. And I know that I'm just uh, pretty much like pr promoting your point here. It, it's going to take focus and attention to detail on every progression of that movement, right? So you mentioned uh, half kneel, reach and row. Well, if they get into a lumbar extension and they're not cute to out of lumbar extension and get back into that, you know, that, that pelvic tilt to get the, you know, an exhalation of, of the rib cage and get that neutral spine, then it's going to happen. And now they're not approaching. Now, now they're in that position. They can use their scapula the way they, the way you want them to on the reach and the reach and row. Cause otherwise that movement's coming from somewhere else. Uh, when, when Correct. they go to protract the scapula, um, Correct. what, if, what patterns are you seeing? I feel like, uh, I'm, I see a ton of thoracic kyphosis. I see a ton of tight pecs. Um, you know, I, it, it, breathing, it, 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 breathing everywhere. No one's using their diaphragm as much. Uh, so as is tight. Like I, I see a lot of these patterns. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to generalize, but I do want uh, young strength and conditioning coaches and PEs to direct their focus. I don't want them to, to leave a stone unturned, right? So um, share that with me. What patterns are you seeing most commonly now? Maybe you didn't see before. Yeah, I think um, the biggest, one of the biggest things that I'm seeing is in the shoulders. Again, generally speaking, is three areas are, are, uh, are lacking in range of motion shoulder internal rotation, shoulder flexion, shoulder horizontal abduction. If those three things are limited, you're going to have a serious rib cage issue, right? Yeah. Um, if you're limited in abduction, it's not a tight pack. It's usually a rib cage that's extended and yeah. up. So if you can teach them to get the rib cage to drop down, that tight pack goes away. You know, so those three areas are the three kind of general areas that like stick out from a mobility perspective that are just like really bad um, on those throwers. Um, you say the rib cage there in that case more um, like a motor control thing then? It's more motor control than mobility. What, what's your take on they that? Lo they lose variability to do different things. Fair they're enough. stuck in just like whatever they're able to do to get by on whatever they have to do which yep. is throw baseball, hit, go home, play video games, 
and sit in class all day. Yep. That's that's their variability. Think about sure. that. Like that's who's coming in. And and this isn't just like high school players, Mike, like college pro, like same thing. Same like thing. Patterns are going away. Um, you know, so this is like across the board. Um, you know, I, I think from a general fitness perspective, um, single leg strength is, is another area that's like that's really important to me to not only train, but also like in those people, it stinks. And because I think it's because most people just like want to get good at, at deadlift and, deadlifting and squatting. So they like neglect the single leg movements. You know, for example, I had a college kid in over the weekend and, you know, it was, it was his first time training, you know, um, his, his, his A1 was trap bar deadlift and it was, you know, I think he's pulled like 415 for like four for like clean, easy reps. Right. And then I give him a, a step down plate offset step down or like a one like squat to a bench for like six a leg and it was like the hardest thing he's ever done wow. so like this is, this is a big boy like strong kid like d1 college sure. baseball player strong on the struggle bus on a one leg squat you know i asked him, like, oh like, you know do you do a lot of this for your college program he's like no everything's Never. bilateral it's bilateral so like you know getting to some single leg stuff another area that like you know and, and if and if, if you're a pt out there and you know, and, and, you, and you train someone and you have, they have an arm issue, um, you know, consult their pitching coach, consult their hitting coach, you know, what's their front leg doing? Are they front leg bracing or is it bent? You know, so again, this is what they do. They throw and they hit, they throw and they hit, they throw and they hit, and they come see you for an hour and then you have to fix them. So it's like, you know, you, you need to know what they're doing out of when oh my you're gosh. not doing that. What? I love it, Rob. You nailed it, man. We I, we got a football player in right now, and the same thing. Like we're gonna get in touch. We have to get in touch with his throwing coach because now he's able. He's cleared to throw. So okay, so we address the deficit at you know it's his elbow, but that's not the real deficit. Like you said, it's shoulder mechanics, the thoracic spine, hip, his his ankle, left ankle, his, his, his uh, lead leg, and 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 a throw. Same thing as a baseball player, essentially. Uh, is it's the same concept. So if his if glute medius is weak and he's leaning to the side, that changes the slot and puts a lot more stress uh, on his elbow. And even, I mean, I, I studied this a little bit more recently, how the hand is coming out when you're pitching. If you're going down and up, that delays the entire upper body and puts it behind and leaves the elbow out to hang. So uh, it's something that freaking simple of how the ball is coming out of the glute can put that much stress on other places. So we have to understand the actual movement as well, especially as PTs, but even as strength coaches, uh, that that are going to lead to a continued deficit that you're trying to address in the gym or, or on the table. Um, so so kudos on that, man. That, that's that's cool stuff. What else do you have to add about that? Uh, just about assessing and analyzing and communicating with coaches. Yeah, I think communication is key. I think that's what you know. Not to like not to like toot our own horn, but like one thing that we do pretty well at MSI is like myself, our pitching coordinator, our hitting coordinator. You know, there's always conversations about athletes and, you know, what they're doing and what we're seeing and what we need to improve on. And, you know, it's just like constant conversations all day long. It's always going to benefit the, um, you know, the athlete out. So I think any way you can communicate with the PT, with the strength coach, with the, with the skill coach, uh, with the parent too, you know, making sure that like, you know, the parent knows that like, hey, you're communicating to help your son. Like that's going to go a long way. And it's like, oh, wow, like this strength coach called my son's physical therapist to like make sure whatever he knows what to do. You know what I mean? Like that's just like to parents that that could be huge. And like, you know, that, that's again, that just shows that you care and that you want to help help people. And to me, that's, you know, that's why if you're in the fitness or, you know, physical therapy field, like that's why you're in it. For sure, man. And, and we have to put our egos aside sometimes. And uh, I'm not I'm not a movement specialist when it comes to uh, the baseball swing, right? Like I'm not going to coach a kid how to swing a bat. I'm th that's not my lane. I have the TPI golf certification. I'm mm -hmm. not teaching anyone how to swing a golf club. I understand the mechanics mm -hmm. of it. I understand what mm -hmm. needs to happen to, to the create as much force as possible. Uh, and then beyond that, beyond the motor control and, and strength component, I'm not doing periodization or any of that kind of stuff for 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 high level mm -hmm. lifting, right? Again, that's not my lane. That's where they they go to see you. So. Um, you know, staying in our lane and communicating and letting Rob do what he does best and, and I'll do what I do best and let the hitting coach do what he does best uh, is what's most important. So communication, I, I feel like I talk about every single podcast is, is huge. Um, no, no. 
Awesome, man. All right. I got a couple quick hitters for you. Is there anything else? All right. Real quick on this. Uh, elbow pain, shoulder pain, you know, the Tommy John. The, I was at a uh, conference a couple years ago. No, not even a year, year and a half ago. Um, Mike Reinold, James Andrews, a uh, line of 12 year olds waiting at the door for Tommy John surgery. Crazy now. It's all year round. Baseball. Uh, I'm seeing advertisements for it now. Tryouts happening left and right. So, um, how much do we need to focus on lower extremity strengthening, whether it's you or us, um, to to help minimize the risk of these injuries? Uh, obviously, I, I agree with you in terms of you know thoracic spine and, the sh and shoulder mechanics. There's enough emphasis on the lower body, and you mentioned single leg. Ironically, single leg strengthening earlier. Um, is there enough emphasis on that? What, what can we do better? Yeah, I think, I think what we can do better is, is, is managing, uh, throwing volume, you know, um, not being on three baseball teams when you're 12 years old and like throwing a hundred pitches on Friday and then throwing a hundred on Sunday, like probably shouldn't be doing that, you know? Um, so I think that's is where like parents need to be educated on what's best for their son or daughter to have a long, healthy career. And playing on three baseball teams at 12 years old is probably not it. Um, you know, not getting them burned out is probably not it. Um, you know, I think us as coaches, we just have to educate parents. And, you know, because the kid wants to play, you know. So Absolutely. it's like, it, it's not the kid's fault. You know what I mean? It's not the player's fault. He wants to play. He wants to compete. You know, so we, so we, we as coaches have to have to learn when to when when to kind of pull them back. You know, and that's just managing volume. You know, I think I think so. I think these players need a quarterback. I need someone to say, hey, like, hey, you threw a hundred on on uh, on Friday. Like, you're done until next Friday. You know, I, I know there's pitching guidelines out there, but like, they're not followed. So there's pitching guidelines for literally, Rob. There's not. not I, I only found this out the other day. Right, they may not even be followed, right? But there's not pitching guidelines. With, and this is fascinating. There's not pitching guidelines, to my understanding, for anything beyond little. And you and I both know little league is what 12 years old. So from 12 to 15, 16, right? So it's three, four years. Where, where especially in baseball, uh, for for boys, that's when that's when you hit your your, your growth spurt. The fields get bigger. Uh, now they have an intermediate field between, uh, you know, the, the big league field and little league. And so, hold on, you mean to tell me that not only did the field get bigger, it, so the pitching distance is longer, right? Uh, not only did uh, are there more baseball teams and all that, but the kids are growing the most at this point in time. Now you removed all lim all restrictions, the pitching restrictions. Like there aren't any, to my understanding, are guidelines for. 13, 14, 15 year olds uh, that are playing in these other in these other leagues. I know there are for little league. I've been told by parents that there are, there are none uh, for for that age group, which is mind blowing to me. Regardless, they're not followed whether there are or not. Um, to me, it's like sirens going off. At bigger fields, yeah. they're growing. It's, it's, it's more of, thing. It's crazy. yeah, it's it's more of like they play on two teams. So like. On Friday, they pitched for this team. On Sunday, they pitched for this team. The coach didn't know they pitched on this team on Friday, and the kid wants to pitch, and, and the parent just shows up, and they need to pay. You know, they paid for them to play, so they need to play. So it's, it's a problem. Um, you know, it's definitely a problem. I know there's some I know there's some inning limits, pitch limits on, like, high school stuff, but, like, right. those, games, those games are so spread apart, and, and, teams are, and you know, the teams are usually lots of players, so it's usually not an issue. But, um, you know, I think that's something that we can do a better job of, just, like, educating parents, players, coaches on on some of that kind of stuff and, and i think um you know from a strength coach perspective it's it's just you know teach good habits you know teach them about the importance of exercise teach them the importance of uh, sleep nutrition you know um, staying active staying healthy you know things to uh, take care of your body you know good 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 uh, work ethic stuff you know teach them to work hard um and that's you know and that's all and that's that's all that's all you can do Something. Hey, amen. Hey, amen. I, I try to remind kids all the time. And I'll say, I'll say this in front of the parents on purpose. Uh, did you have fun? Like, like, or, or I tell them to go, make sure you have fun this weekend. That's what you do it for. Right. That's what it's all about. You and I played little league ball together. We yeah. love playing ball. Uh, I remember playing with you really well. And that was, it was always, it was about having fun. 
you know, winning's great. Winning is fun. Uh, but uh, but it's all about having so we can't as um, as trans conditioning coaches or PTs or, or coaches in general, we gotta make sure that's the focus. And and I feel like the root of all evil, so to is parents want to win, kids want to win, coaches want to win. There's pressure on all three, real not really so, so much the parents, but the kids and the coaches, and uh, that us educating kind of kind of takes the winning out of it, and it's about helping them. So, well done, man. All right, cool. I got some quick hitters for you. Uh, let's see how we do with this. So I got five. Um, you good with this? You ready to go? I'm, I'm ready. I'll all try right, to be right. quick. Sorry, sorry, I ramble. I'll try to be quick. <laughs> no, listen, you need both. Uh, all right, weighted ball throws. Age age appropriateness. Or what do you say? I think just like anything, it has to be dosed appropriately. It has to be assessed appropriately. It has to be coached appropriately. All right. Uh, elbow injuries. Why? Um, underprepared. All right. Pitch counts in high school. Uh, I don't know the. I know this exists. I should probably know this, but I'm not. Should, should they be? Should they be better? That. Should they be better? Should they be better enforced? Not. I don't need the exact number, but pitch counts in high school. Yeah. Uh, and we kind of touched on a little bit already, so not fair. But should they, should they be better enforced? And how can they be better enforced? I think they should be definitely better enforced. And I think, it, like, if you're if you pitch, then you go and catch, or you go and play center field, and you go chuck it. 250 feet it's not being enforced so that's the problem in high school it's like if you're the pitcher you're probably the best player in the team or one of the best players so it's hard to like keep that player off the field i get it uh that's a tough one um i don't i don't have a solution for that one just like be smart and if you're not feeling good don't throw yeah i'm 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 leaving that one up to the uh to the ones that to, to, to the people who are smart smarter than I am, they can figure that one out. But we, we, we <laughs> yeah. need to find a way to do it. And I think education's uh, first and foremost, right? To to enforce it's tough. Um, all right, I have here baseball trainers uh, or coaches could could do better. Let's talk about coaches in particular. What could coaches do better? And not even strength coaches, baseball coaches. Yeah, I, I think baseball coaches just need to be educated. You kind of, you kind of talked about it earlier about staying in your lane. I'm all for staying in your lane, but you also have to be educated on the other on the other lanes. You know, like you know a little bit about strength conditioning. I know a little bit about physical therapy. I know a little bit about throwing. I know a little bit about hitting. You know, but like I don't do those things. Like I, you know, I think just like being educated on those areas, so that when you need to have a conversation with someone in that area, you're knowledgeable and you're able to speak the same language. So I think just like you know, if you're a hitting coach, like it's okay to take a con ed course about programming because like when you're teaching hitting like you're programming hitting and you're giving hitting drills and you're giving constraint drills and you're doing the same thing you're just like you're just swinging a bat instead of lifting a weight so you know learning from other disciplines at times is always a good thing i think not being afraid with along those lines don't be afraid to, to reach out to another resource you weren't very hard to get a hold of rob i'm not very hard to get a hold of uh to reach out ask a question uh, you know, baseball coaches aren't hard to get a hold of. So, you know, be afraid to reach out and ask a question. Can't hurt. Um, Absolutely. All right, I got two more. Sleep or stretch? Sleep or stretch. Don't use it. Don't like it. <laughs> Toss uh, it out. Haven't used it. Don't like it. Do other stuff that gets way better results a lot quicker. Um, you know. Uh, yeah. this, is this is pretty straightforward. I, I, that's I'm my quick that. hit. I don't want to dive into it, but like, if you want to, you want a quick hitters. That's my quick hit. <laughs> I can tell you can't wait to go in on that one. That's great. Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm way overutilized. Uh, anyone I've seen even use a clinic, uh, justify. Tell me why you're doing it. Like, like, why are you trying to improve uh, internal uh, rotation or get or whatever mobility of, of that joint? Like, tell me what you're trying. What is I'll the tell you I'm doing? I'll tell you I'll tell you why, because Please. that's the only method they know how to increase range of motion is static stretching. Uh, like, sh again, not not to not to get too deep here, but like, no, no, go ahead. If the shoulder is limited internal rotation, stretching is yeah. not going to fix it. Um, doing some end range isometrics. I'm not sure if you're familiar with any like FRC concepts. Absolutely, um, man. Like that might that that's not sleeper stretching, but like that's end range isometrics. That that I've done, um, but I'm still doing some rib cage 
uh, mobility work way before I'm going to just like tell someone to go crank on the shoulder and the sleeper stretch. Well done. Crank on the shoulder. You nailed it with that, dude. Uh, Phil Connelly, uh, former trainer, you probably learned from him. Uh, that's baseball in the small world in this area. Phil Donnelly, old school trainer, PT, Philly. So well. came the, he came to Widener. Uh, literally, he's like, all right, take off your shirt. Lines drawn all over the scapula. He's like, what are you, what are you touching the glenohumeral humor going for? It's got nothing to do with this. All yep. scapula thoracic. So uh, yep. you nailed it with that. You're focusing that as opposed to doing something like a super stretch. Uh, love end range isometrics, uh, even eccentrics, as long as it's done safely and not in a provocative position. Uh, love it. I'm not crazy about doing, you know, external rotation or going into internal rotation up in that position into eccentrics. But uh, I, I love doing it uh, in safe positions where they're feeling coordination of, and recruitment muscles. Um, all right. So uh, last one, bench press, baseball, bench press for pitchers in particular. Um. I don't do a lot of barbell pressing for baseball players. We'll do some dumbbell pressing occasionally. Lots and lots of landmine pressing. Lots and lots of push-ups. Lots and lots of one-arm cable pressing. Okay. Uh, the, the logic behind the press, in your opinion, uh, so, is, is what? Go ahead. So, so the reason I don't do a ton of pressing variations, um, it's just it, it comes down to like, why what at what exercises are we choosing so if we're comparing a landmine press and a dumbbell press even just dumbbell we'll stick dumbbell right let's take a look at the rib cage where's the rib cage at when you do a dumbbell bench press it's extended where's the scapula when you do a dumbbell bench press both are downly rotated and retracted maximally okay where's the arm humerus when you do a dumbbell bench press okay it comes down to the side of the body and presses back up, okay? If you come down a little bit too far, guess where the humerus is going to go? Or if you don't have a lot of internal rotation in the shoulder and you come down to do a bench press and you don't have a lot of internal rotation, guess where the humerus is going to go? It's going to roll forward in the socket and place a lot of stress on the anterior portion of the shoulder. As you know from working with a lot of throwers, anterior shoulder pain is a very common thrower's injury. Placing a lot of anterior shoulder pain on is not something that you want to train and do a lot of. Um, so that's the dumbbell bench press. Hey, it's a great exercise that's developing pressing strength. Love it, All right? The landmine press, let's break that down. Where's the rib cage? If coached properly, it's not extended because it doesn't need to be because it shouldn't be. If you press the landmine up overhead, scapula will follow we'll go into upward rotation humerus will follow right so we're driving scapula upward rotation on the way down we're working on eccentric control of the scapula and downward rotation right rib cage is still controlled if you add an opposite reach and they're able to do that appropriately we're now driving trunk rotation okay yeah. so um, those are the qualities and we're getting pressing strength unilaterally in a half kneeling position if you ever take a picture of someone doing a half kneeling one arm landmine press or a standing split stance one arm landmine press, if you don't know what those exercises are, go Google them or YouTube them on my YouTube page. <laughs> they they look very similar to someone throwing a baseball. Okay. Um, I'm not saying it's a sports specific exercise. I'm just saying it looks similar because um, I don't believe in sports specific exercises. I believe in doing training that has carryover to improving sport outcomes. Um, so, you know, what are the negatives of any of the landmine press that I said? There are no negatives to that exercise. None. If anything, way more positives than doing a dumbbell bench press. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's how now, like, if you're looking at that, it's like, hey, which exercise am I going to choose for this person that plays baseball and, and presents with this shoulder range of motion? Um, you know, I didn't even get into that. The fact that if you do a bench press, their upper back is really tight and compressed and flat. When you do a landmine press, it's the complete opposite of that. It's rounded. And if you add inhales and exhales, it's going to expand, um, which is going to improve health and performance at the same time. Whereas the bench press just improves performance. So again, you have to have a good balance in your programs and understand what actually happens to the body when it's doing an exercise. Now, 
again, like I'm kind of ranting here a little bit, but like I do some bench press variations, dumbbell variations, one arm variations. I don't do a ton of barbell um, just because it really limits. It makes those reasons that I just said in a dumbbell variation just worse. I, I think it's, to an extent, if you're doing a dumbbell variation, you can get a degree of stability of the scapula, uh, you know, with the arm extended in particular and throughout the range a little bit. But you're right with with a, a you nailed it. Uh, the difference just from a fundamental perspective, uh, you're extremely technical and I'm following everything. I love the biomechanics. I could talk to you about this stuff for hours, dude. It, the spine is upright, right? When, when you're in the, when you're in a tall kneeling position, that is a more functional position than supine on your back. You don't play baseball from your back. You don't throw a ball from your back. Uh, not to mention the simple, the simplicity of the scapula being downwardly rotated is not a functional position per se for a baseball player. So why are you stabilizing or strengthening, enforce, reinforcing that position? So it's really simple. The shoulder blade being down isn't isn't going to help. You want it to be abducted and up, and therefore uh, that's more functional, right? So yeah, not to mention, you can you can see it correct. It's easy to correct if you're getting lumbar lumbar lordosis or you know uh, too much extension of the spine right you can correct those things in uh, someone in a tall kneeling position versus someone in, in the two doing the press uh yep. and that's just again this, the simple parts of it so i love it man this has uh been super educational what else do you want to get out to uh anyone who's listening i feel like you have a wealth of knowledge uh and probably plenty of hot topics that, that you that you could dive into yeah. what, what else you want to get out there yeah, no, I think, um, you know, I think, I think it's good just to, to get the message out that like, Hey man, like, you know, my doors are open, you know, if anyone wants to come in, hang out, observe, I know it's COVID stuff, but like, you know, any other time, like there's no secrets here. You know, I, I do a little bit on social media. I should be better. I'm not, I think, you're, I think you're pretty good. I need, I feel like I need to be better, man. You're all these bodies, aces and show and exercises uh, and explaining why. Oh, no, you're best, good, man. You're like, great. You know, social media sometimes doesn't get the message across, and sure, you know. So, like, I think if anything, I can I can get out there today. It's just like, you know, hey, care about people, help people. Um, you know, always be learning. You know, I always like to look back at my programs five years ago, and uh, look back and say, wow, that program sucked. You know, because I've learned so much over the past five years that, like, I look back and I was like, what the heck was I doing? You know, even simple things from like my like some of the business acumen stuff, like, like I talked about earlier, like, you know, just growing from all areas, you know, and um, don't, don't, don't get stagnant. And I'm not saying like, do the new fancy draw on Instagram. I'm saying like, always edit your philosophy, always be willing to have an open mind and willing to learn. Um, you know, because if you're, if you shut the doors of learning, um, you're not going to get better and you're not going to be a, a good person for that. So you know, I always look to learn from those around me, my peers, my staff, you know, it's not all about me. It's about the people around me that, that help that help build a good team. And, you know, if I can, if I can uh, lead that team, you know, I would definitely continue to do so. How often are you on the attack on Instagram? Meaning like, uh, like seeing something that someone shouldn't be doing. Are you ever commenting saying like, this is awful. This is trash. See, and that's interesting. You're shaking your head now. I'm assuming that's a no. That's a no. That's a no. Good. I'm the, I'm the same way. Man. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know that person. Like, I was, no. I'm with you, Rob. I'm with you. It's funny to me that the people who aren't educated, uh, have the, the education you have and the knowledge you have are the first ones to, you know, call someone out for doing an exercise. Uh, so, so I, I think it's important and social media has changed so much since, you know, since you and I have grown up that it's important for, for people before you go and implement that in your or in your gym, ask, like, ask why, who's that appropriate for? Are like, is that a cool exercise you made up because you think it's, you know, going to help with something in particular, like, like who's that appropriate for? And yeah. why don't think that oh, I got a baseball player. Let's do, you know, let's do that cool exercise on a plyo ball doing a landmine press, like mm -hmm. not appropriate mm -hmm. for that person. So, um, right. amen, dude, uh, this has been really cool. Uh, how do, how do people get in touch with you, Rob? Yeah, I mean, Instagram, Rob Urbina3. I'm, again, I try to be active as possible. Twitter, uh, just at Rob Urbina. Um, and then email, you know, sportsperformance.maplezone.com. Um, but, yeah, just like I said, just, you know, always available to chat. Love to talk training. Love to learn. Love to watch. You know, love to meet good people, talk to good people, um, no matter where you are. You know, I, I, there's a 
people i know a lot of people from a lot of different areas so like you know it's there it's not just this philly area you know i had a guy fly in from oklahoma over the weekend you know so guys guys, guys come all over to, to do some training and get better and um you know I'm, I'm again like i said i'm here to help people and, and if anyone wants to learn from me my door's open okay rob it's been awesome having you on um this has been cool, man. Uh, a pleasure as always. And, um, yeah, man, that's a wrap. We're all good. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, no problem, man. Thanks for listening to the On Cue Performance Therapy Podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It would mean so much to me if you could leave us a five-star review so more listeners like you could get this important information. See you next time. <laughs>